Good afternoon and welcome. I am Martel Teasley, uh, Interim Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Co-Chair of the Academic Freedom Committee. Thank you for coming here today. I'd like to begin by reading our Indigenous Land Acknowledgement Statement, which many of you have heard before. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities to research, education, commun and community outreach activities. Again, I'm happy to see you here today, especially to faculty, students, and staff members that may be here. And thank you to employees and staff members of the Hinckley team. I'd like to first just recognize members of our Academic Freedom Committee who are here today with us or who may not be here. First, Allison Moyer, librarian of the Merritt Library. Hi, Allison. Uh, Ken Allen Ono, professor of the Department of Communications. Austin Ritter, professor of the S.J. Quinn School of Law. Marianne Viriel, vice president of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Ronil Anderson Jones, professor, S.J. Quinn College of Law. Jason Perry, vice president of government relations. And with that, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Paul Castle, professor of the S.J. Uh, Quinn School of Law and co-chair of this committee, as I said. Do we need the, I guess we do need the microphone, is that? Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Dr. Teasley. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Paul Cassell from the S.J. Quinney College of Law, along with Dr. Teasley, co-chair of this uh, committee on academic freedom that we have been working uh, on, together on, along with the other members that he mentioned over the last uh, year or so. Uh, the committee was formed by President Taylor Randall in the fall of last year as part of Operation Bold Transition. Uh, the committee includes diverse membership, as Dr. Teasley mentioned, and our mission is to provide opportunities to strengthen and discuss the U's role as a leader in civic engagement, primarily with regard to preserving the power of speaking to someone, not with whom you agree, but with whom you disagree. And as we thought about ways that we might encourage respectful engagement, we thought a perfect week for doing that would be Constitution Week. Uh, and so we thought we would have our first forum. And as we celebrate our U.S. Constitution being signed on September 17, 1787, we are particularly mindful of the importance and significance of the First Amendment, which preserves the right to free speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of religion. As we will soon hear from Professor Hassan in his remarks, the right to free speech is a foundation of democracy. But as political opinions have become increasingly polarized, we must think about ways to keep our conversations alive, informative, and respectful. And at the U, we have a perfect opportunity to model that respectful discussion. And at the end of the day, we can talk about hot mutton topics like Professor Hassan will be talking about, but then walk away having learned something in an amicable way, having both sides having an opportunity to present their points of view. So our intention here today is to provide an impetus for those kinds of discussions. After Professor Hassan's remarks, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A, and then we can talk one another, uh, among one another here about the issues that he's raised. So I look forward to hearing from uh, Professor Hassan, but first a brief introduction of Professor Hassan from my colleague, Professor Ronell Anderson-Jones.
Thanks, Professor Cassell. Um, I'm excited to have Professor Richard Hassan um, here to speak with us. He has a very busy schedule, um, so we're fortunate um, that he was able to make uh, time to come. Uh, Professor Hassan is an internationally recognized expert in um, election law and campaign finance regulation. He's the author of more than 100 articles on election law issues, um, published in top journals, including Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review, and the Supreme Court Law Review. He has been named one of uh, the 100 most influential lawyers in America by National Law Journal and one of the top 100 lawyers in California by the Los Angeles and San Francisco Daily Journal. Uh, Professor, uh, if Professor Hassan's um, name or face uh, seems familiar to you, it is because he is, um, in my mind, uh, quite literally the hardest working legal academic of his time on um, the most pressing issues of our day, um, really has taken on the mantle of um, translating complex and important legal concepts uh, to the American public in ways that are critically important and valuable. His op-eds and commentaries have appeared in many publications, including uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and Political and Slate. He served in um, 2020 as a CNN election law analyst, offering up what I think we can now view as absolutely prophetic forecasts on some key uh, legal issues. Uh, he runs the popular election law blog, uh, directs UCLA Law's uh, important new safeguarding democracy project, and has produced a body of work that is foundational to scholars in a wide variety of fields who are working in sort of uh, subfields as varied as uh, government transparency and uh, democracy preservation and voting rights uh, and um, expressive freedoms. This is certainly true in my own work on press freedom issues where I found his insights on relationships between politics uh, and our new media environment to be both uh, incredibly illuminating and um, deeply insightful. Uh, Professor Hassan's most recent book, Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It, uh, which I know a number of you have been reading for class and in uh, campus book group, uh, was named one of the four best books on disinformation uh, by the New York Times. So on behalf of our whole uh, university community, um, I want to thank him so much for being here. Uh, we look forward to learning from him today. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Rick Hassan. Thanks so much, Ronell. Thanks to all of you. And thanks for setting expectations low. I appreciate <laughs> it. It's great to be with you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, it's Constitution Week, or Con it was Constitution Day, I think, on the 17th. But we're celebrating it today. So uh, I'm going to talk about the conflict or the potential conflict between wanting to have a democracy with free and fair elections and a society that's committed to robust, sometimes uncomfortable, and controversial political speech. How can we do both of those things in the current era? So that's, that's the topic of today, and it's the topic uh, of my book. And let me talk for a minute about what I mean by cheap speech. Uh, often when I'm interviewed about the book, that's the first question. What is cheap speech? And the term is not mine. The term is actually uh, coined by a fellow UCLA, UCLA law professor named Eugene Volokh. He wrote an article in 1995 um, where he was talking about what the new internet era was going to bring. It was 1995, it was a long time ago. He was pretty prescient. He predicted things like the rise of what we would now call Netflix or Spotify. Uh, he thought that we would have our favorite op-ed writers and we would uh, find their content online and we would print it out and read it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he foresaw the iPad, uh, but, uh, but he, was, he was pretty good. And one of the things he said, and my interest is in politics uh, and uh, the relationship between speech and politics, one of the things he said was that what was going to happen um, as we uh, move from an era of media scarcity to an era of um, abundant media is that we were going to lose the intermediaries that... Uh, helped to um, uh, uh, decide what content we could hear. So in 1995, if you saw something in the New York Times uh, or in the local newspaper, you didn't like it, uh, what could you do? You could write a letter to the editor. If you were very lucky and the editors thought what you had to say was worthy, it might be printed in the newspaper. Otherwise, you could you know, stand on a soapbox and yell about it. But you didn't have a way to really express yourself. Uh, and um, he foresaw that uh, intermediaries would decline, 
And he asked, would democracy do well without these intermediaries? I think yes, but others might disagree. And I would say that, uh, unfortunately, although there are many positive aspects of the new media environment, there are also some negative ones. And so um, today, if you don't like what uh, you see in the New York Times, uh, you can go on to any one of a number of social media platforms. You can make a video. You can have your content distributed to just about anyone. And, and that can be great. Um, you know, there are so many better ways now of us being able to communicate with, with each other and to find each other. All of that is very positive. I think the George, George Floyd racial justice movement would not have taken off the way it did if there were not a cell phone video of what we uh, were able to see uh, happening in Minnesota. So those are all positive things, but there's a dark side too. And I draw a pretty straight line between the uh, emergence of cheap speech and what we saw on January 6, 2021 with the insurrection at the Capitol. And so by cheap speech, I mean not just speech that is cheap to produce and disseminate. That's what Professor Volokh meant, inexpensive speech. I mean we have a system where low-value speech, for example, disinformation, false claims, has an advantage in the marketplace over higher-valued speech. So today, if you're an investigative journalist, you work for a, a newspaper or a website that does real, you know, looking at corruption in, in City Hall or in, in Washington, D.C., if you want to do that, it's really expensive to produce that content. But if you want to make up a story about a politician, it's very cheap to produce a, a, a slick-looking website, put up the content. You don't have to do any investigation. Just say whatever you want to say. And so we have a system today where Professor Volokh was right. Those intermediaries that we use to help us tell the truth, they've declined. We know that newspaper journalists have lost jobs faster than coal miners in the last 10 years. It's just not the economic marketplace. What supported newspapers? First, it was classified advertising. Now, then there became Craigslist, right? Facebook Marketplace. You don't go to the, if you want to buy a bicycle, you know, a used bicycle, would you think to look in the Salt Lake Tribune, right? That, you, you wouldn't even think of that, but you would have 20 years ago, right? So uh, you want to buy a car. Would you look in the auto section in the back of the newspaper? Well, I did in the 1990s, but today, you know, you're going to go to, a website, and you're going to find a car that way. The economic model for journalism, uh, especially local journalism, has collapsed. Many local newspapers have closed, and they've been replaced with partisan, sometimes foreign propaganda masquerading as local news. And what cheap speech, uh, what the cheap speech era means is that it's very easy to put false information and misleading information out there and there is no check on whether or not that information is true or false. And not only that, it provides opportunities for like-minded people, like the people who decided to invade the Capitol on January 6th. They could find each other. How'd they find each other? On Facebook groups. How would they have found each other in 1995? So I really believe it would have been much harder for the kinds of... Um, uh, undermining of our democracy that we saw on January 6, 2021, to have happened if we had the same politics of today, but the technology of the 1990s. Right, so that's one of the claims I make in cheap speech. But uh, that's not the only thing uh, that uh, uh, is a worry about uh, democracy and, and cheap speech. And I, I want to talk about what some of the other problems are. I just want to first show you just a a quick video about how um, soon, very soon, we might not be able to see or uh, we might not uh, believe what we see or hear. Being a complicated computer program, millions of images and sound bites, it can learn to do this. President Trump is a total and complete dip. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone. Jordan Peele. It's called a deep fake. We have the facts. Crafting realistic humanoids in video games or CGI movies used to take years of training, hundreds of people, and millions of dollars. But that's just not the case anymore. 
Today, with just a little facial mapping and powerful artificial intelligence, these sophisticated machine learning techniques are becoming accessible to people who don't necessarily have massive movie making budgets. Usually, deepfakes are created to make unique videos, like making Nicolas Cage play Lois Lane in Superman, or putting Steve Buscemi's face on Jennifer Lawrence's body during a Golden Globe speech. I, I just like, it was just, I, this, was, this was very truly surprising for me. But as the technology advances and becomes more believable, worries abound. And this uh, ability to, which is rapidly growing, to produce false information uh, through video or audio uh, can be very dangerous. Imagine in the 2024 election a video of Joe Biden appearing to collapse, like having a heart attack, or Donald Trump saying a racial epithet. Imagine these are just falsely made, but they go on to social media and they're believed. Right? So how are we going to have a society where we expect that the way that voters make decisions is they gather information and decide who should I vote for? Who is in my interest? Who shares my values when we're flooded with a sea of disinformation? And so in this new era of cheap speech, I list uh, on this slide a number of problems that we have seen or will see. First, uh, decreased voter confidence. Right? It's harder to know what's true and what's not true. Uh, we know that older Americans are more likely to believe false information than younger Americans. But we know that younger Americans are more likely to disbelieve everything they see and discount even true information. So I don't believe anything I read. And then, so how are you supposed to make a good decision? Um, this is especially true as local newspapers have disappeared because we know that's what people relied upon as a really good source of information. And when it's replaced by websites that purport to be local news but are actually really run by Democratic operatives, I'll give an example of that in my book, Courier News, or run by Republican operatives, or even run by the Russian government, uh, Peace News, uh, then you know, how do you know what's true? We also saw in the 2016 election a rise of foreign interference in elections. We had Russian operatives posing as black activists, telling people, don't vote for Hillary Clinton. She hasn't done enough for our community. But that was really not a black activist in the United States, although it looked like it. It was someone in uh, St. Petersburg. Um, we have uh, just a rise not only of disinformation, but misinformation. And the difference there is disinformation is deliberately spread false information. Misinformation is not necessarily deliberately spread. I'm going to talk about an example of that uh, in a minute. Increased conspiracy theory acceptance um, and potential for election-related violence, right? So after Donald Trump said, come to Washington, D.C. on January 6th, be wild, going to be a wild protest, we know that there were lots of messages exchanged about potentially having a 1776 moment, having a revolution in the Capitol. Rising anonymous campaign activity. Under the campaign finance laws, if a, t if a TV ad for a candidate, if you get it on your cable TV box, who is spending on that ad is subject to disclosure. But if that same ad comes to you through Hulu, it's not, because it comes from a, an internet provider. It's something that makes no sense today. But the rules depend on what the technology is. Um, we already are a polarized society. Social media, uh, at least there's some evidence, exacerbates polarization. It also provides a way for demagogues to fundraise. So in the old days, if you were an extreme candidate, the political party would be the one that would be raising a lot of funds. They wouldn't support you. Today, the more outrageous you are, you just have a little link. People can click two, two clicks, and you can give $5 or $20 or $100 to an extreme candidate. And there's the threat that algorithms, that these are the computer programs that dictate what we see and how we see them, that they could be manipulated. There was one point uh, during the 2020 election where on Instagram, if you search for Joe Biden, you would get positive stories also about Donald Trump. But if you search for Donald Trump, you wouldn't also get positive stories about Joe Biden. And, and, uh, Meta, the company uh, that owns Instagram, said it was a glitch, it, that it, was, it was inadvertent. But there's nothing in the law that would stop a company from doing that on purpose. You know, what if Google decided, we really like Joe Biden, and so anytime you search for Trump, we're going to give you really negative information. Nothing would stop that now. And you know, Google search, pretty powerful. How are we going to deal with those situations? This is especially dangerous when it comes to elections. Uh, we know that Donald Trump 
between um, November 3rd on election day of 2020 and November 23rd went to Twitter 400 times to make the false claim that the election was stolen or rigged. And the result? Only 26% of Republican voters believe that Joe Biden actually won the election, even though all the reliable evidence is that he did, that there was no fraud. So I'm concerned especially about that kind of disinformation. And I said the difference between disinformation and misinformation. Let me tell you a little bit about this viral tweet. Um, so there was a guy in Wisconsin, not this guy Thomas Kennedy, a, a different guy in Wisconsin was walking near his house and he saw these mailboxes all posted, uh, all stacked on top of each other. And he posted on Facebook, he said, oh no, is this the attempt by DeJoy, who was the postmaster general, who was a Trump appointee? Is he trying to do something so that mail-in ballots won't be counted? And then people wrote back to him and said, um, no, actually, this is the place where they send the old post office boxes to be refinished so that, you know, they, so they can be repainted and they can be put back into service. But people picked up this picture, and this is guy, Thomas Kennedy, is a, uh, he's a political activist on the left in Florida, and um, he saw the picture, and here he wrote, you know, this is part of a massive voter suppression, part of their plan, the Republicans' plan, to steal the election. So I interviewed uh, Mr. Kennedy and I asked him, I said, you know, did you do any verification of this? He said, no, but I saw this and I was worried and so I posted it. Disinformation, was he intending to mislead people? Misinformation? In some ways it doesn't matter. Um, it certainly was false information. This was not part of a voter suppression plan. This was in fact just an innocuous thing that happened. But today, and, and, and you know, this got picked up and it got thousands and thousands of shares in, on different social media platforms, including by some very prominent people. So disinformation can spread very easily in this environment, and it just reaffirms what people already believe in a polarized environment. Okay, so what can law do? How can we have a, a, a system that is both committed to free and fair elections and to free speech? Because you can't have a democracy without both of those things. You need to be able to have a system where people can get information, they can find out what they believe and they can vote, um, consistent with what they believe, and a system where people can speak and say what they think and try and convince others. Um, so I have a whole list of things that I think could be done. I'm gonna run through them quickly and then focus in on a few of them. One is run good elections. Fair election administration, that's not a, that doesn't create a speech conflict, but that's really important. We need to adequately fund elections so that uh, conspiracy theorists can't latch on to something and say, aha, this proves the election was stolen. In fact, most of the time when something goes wrong in an election, and I've been studying elections for a very long time, it's because someone was incompetent, right? Not because someone was uh, trying to steal an election. Um, improved disclosure of online political activity. So you should know who's spending to try to influence your opinion. So if I tell you that uh, there's a candidate and uh, there are two candidates running for office, one is backed by the NRA, the other is backed by Planned Parenthood. That's all I tell you about the candidates. I bet you would know how you would vote on that candidate. We use information as a shortcut of who's behind candidates, who's funding candidates, as a way of making decisions cons consistent with our interests. But now it's very easy to have undisclosed information online. Um, we could label deep fakes as altered so people would know, you know, that's really Jordan Peele, that's not Barack Obama making that uh, speech. Um, we could um, uh, have a narrow ban on lies about when, where, and how people vote. I'm gonna talk about that a little more. We can use private uh, defamation lawsuits as a way of dealing with this, and we're seeing that now with lawsuits being brought by voting machine companies against uh, Fox News and against um, Newsmax for making false claims that the voting machines were being rigged. Uh, we might limit how, com how candidates can use social media companies to target ads. Right? So we know that sometimes misleading ads are targeted to, you know, young Latina women get one ad, older white blue collar worker men get another ad. That's called micro-targeting. That leads to uh, a, an easier ability to spread disinformation. We might apply antitrust to break up the platforms. One thing I think we should not do, which I'm gonna talk about, is enact laws aimed at providing even-handedness or requiring platforms to carry all politicians. And I'll talk about that. So I'm gonna focus on three things. Better disclosure, ban on false election speech, and social media must carry regulation. Would these laws be consistent with the First Amendment? So what does the First Amendment say on this? 
It's just a few words, the relevant part of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And there are hundreds of cases uh, that uh, explain what this means in the political context. The Supreme Court's decided some of them. Other courts have decided others. The words don't define themselves, and there's a whole long history as to how they've been interpreted. And one of the things I argue in the book, I get into a lot of the cases, and probably more detail uh, than you want to hear uh, in this talk, uh, one of the things I would say is that under t current Supreme Court precedent, some of what I propose probably would be found to be unconstitutional under the First Amendment. That's not how I believe the First Amendment should be interpreted. But the court has uh, you know, come up with a number of different um, uh, rulings in these areas. And so let me talk about some of those. So how does it work? It generally requires a balancing of government interests against rights of free speech and free association. So take the question of disclosure, right? So under current law, some kinds of spending on political ads, the person who's paying for it, that information gets disclosed. You know that part when you watch a TV commercial and someone says, uh, you know, I'm Joe Biden and I approve this message? That's because uh, federal law requires that the candidate say that so you know that it's a candidate speaking. Well, for a long time, the Supreme Court has said that these disclosure laws are constitutional. Unless you could show that you could be harassed for what you uh, can say, and then you get an exemption. If you can't show harassment, the Supreme Court has said these laws are justified by three really important government interests. One, preventing corruption. If I know someone's giving lots of money to a candidate, maybe I can look for some, some deals between them, some corruption. Second, providing information to voters, that NRA example, the Planned Parent example. If you know who's funding the speech, it helps voters make good decisions. And third, the enforcement interest. We have a law that says that foreign governments and other foreign entities can't spend money in US elections. Well, how do you know if it's foreign money without disclosure? So for a long time, the Supreme Court has said disclosure as low as $100 could be uh, allowed. But things have changed. So I remember back starting in like the 2012 election, you could go onto uh, different websites and you could see, using geomapping, how all of your neighbors had contributed. Right? And today, many more, um, so, you know, so like I live in a very liberal part near Hollywood in Los Angeles. You can find the Trump supporters on your block, you know, or find the Joe Biden supporters in the most conservative part of Utah. You can find them for someone who's given as little as $100. And so now the Supreme Court is saying, well, wait a minute, maybe there's some kind of privacy interest here. One of the ways I would deal with this is I, was, I would raise the threshold. I don't think it really matters that a, a neighbor of mine has given $100 to a candidate I don't like, but I want to know who's giving $10,000 or $100,000 or a million dollars. So we could raise the threshold. But the Supreme Court has started to say, in a, uh, uh, most recently in a case called Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta, B-O-N-T-A, could look it up if you want. Last summer, the court has said uh, that we're really worried about this chill about disclosure of information. And it's very different than what Justice Scalia, who was one of the most conserved justices on the Supreme Court, he, he died um, about five years ago. He wrote, for my part, and this is in upholding a law requiring disclosure, I do not look forward to a society which, thanks to the Supreme Court, uh, uh, cam uh, campaigns can uh, act anonymously, and even exercises in direct democracy and initiative and petition are hidden from public scrutiny and protected from the accountability of criticism. This does not resemble the home of the brave. And we've seen this transition among conservatives much more worried about chilling political activity. So I want to have deep fakes labeled, labeled as altered. I want to have ads that are run on um, Facebook or through Hulu. Uh, be disclosed, I'm not sure that the Supreme Court would allow that because their reading of the First Amendment is different than my reading of the First Amendment. How do you balance these social interests? I think it's really important in an era of disinformation that we know who is behind the speech. Okay, next example. I think we can have a law that uh, would ban um, people from lying about when, where, and how people vote. Democrats vote on Tuesday, Republicans vote on Wednesday, right? That's a that's a false statement that we see uh, set out from time to time. Or, um, you know, you can vote by text. There was a Trump supporter in 2016 who targeted messages at African-American voters telling them, vote by text or social media hashtag. You don't need to go to the polling place. 
Uh, he's now under indictment for that activity. Not clear to me that the law he was indicted under actually applies in this context, but I think you could have a law about lying about when, where, and how people vote. Now, what has the Supreme Court said about this? Can you have laws that ban lying? Well, we do have some laws that the Supreme Court has said you can ban about lying. For example, perjury laws, laws that say you can't get into court and lie on the stand, right? Lie when you're under oath about a fact. Because there's such an important interest in truth-telling in a courtroom that we're going to say that you know, we're going to limit what you say. But there was a case called United States versus Alvarez where a guy violated a federal law that made it a crime to lie about uh, any medals you had won. It's called the Stolen Valor Act in military service. Lie about your military service. And the Supreme Court said, you know, this is a contested political issue. It's not like being in a courtroom. We're going to let people lie. The First Amendment says the remedy for this is counter speech. So this guy gets up at a city council meeting and says, I, you know, I won this medal fighting in Afghanistan. Well, you come back and say, no, you didn't. You're a liar. And that we use counter speech. So when is counter speech the only rationale? And when can you ban a false statement? I think that you can ban statements of, uh, that are lies about when, where, and how people vote, because those are empirically verifiable. But you could, shouldn't be able to uh, ban a statement like a Donald Trump statement, the election is rigged, right? That's a campaign statement. That's not an election statement. So the kind of things that people say in campaigns, let's rely on counter speech. And the Supreme Court has said, um, in a case from a few years ago called Mansky, that the government has a strong interest in preventing false speech about how people vote, when people vote. And so why is that? Because that's an immediate thing. You could disenfranchise people. You send someone to the wrong polling place, they may be disenfranchised. So I'm not sure what the Supreme Court would say. They did suggest in this Mansky case that a narrow law would be OK. And maybe that kind of law would encourage social media companies to remove more content that is um, containing false statements about elections. OK, finally. What about laws requiring social media companies to carry all politicians? So you may know that during the 2020 election, Donald Trump's um, tweets and his Facebook posts carried labels or warnings. I said, you know, uh, on Facebook it would say, um, uh, learn more about the election, go to USA.gov. Didn't really say it was a lie. Facebook would say something like, this information is disputed. Click here for more uh, information. Turns out that statements that were labeled by Twitter as potentially false by Donald Trump were shared more than those that were not. And there were many people calling for Donald Trump to be removed from the platform, especially when he made claims like, come to um, Washington, D.C. on January 6th for the wild protests. But Donald Trump was not removed from the platforms until the January 6th insurrection, until after he didn't come out forcefully enough to tell people to leave the Capitol in the middle of this uh, riot. Twitter has indefinitely removed Donald Trump. Facebook initially removed him forever, but they created their own oversight board. Their oversight board said, you need to give a time limit on it, and you need to give a reason. They said, OK, he's off for two years. So on January 7, 2023, he might be restored to Facebook. And what is that going to depend on? Facebook came up with a rule. If he is still a threat to a peace in society, then he'll be removed from Facebook. Well, Florida and Texas didn't like this. And they each passed laws saying, um, you may not uh, remove uh, or exclude politicians no matter what they say. Florida and Texas, both. Uh, states where the governors are strong supporters of Donald Trump. And it's pretty clear that this law is aimed first and foremost at protecting Donald Trump. Does this violate the First Amendment? So think about this. On the one hand, the platforms are kind of like Fox News or the New York Times. They're private actors. They decide what content to include or exclude. right? And they should have a First Amendment right to decide, you know, we don't want to be associated with a particular uh, candidate. On the other hand, um, they're really powerful. Right? They're, the, these companies are really powerful. It matters whether or not a candidate is going to be on Facebook, 
How could you have a situation where someone's running for president and one candidate's allowed on and the other one is not allowed on? Are, are these companies so powerful that we should treat them like government actors and say they have to be even-handed? Do you want to give the government that power to tell a private company what to do? The Supreme Court has been very clear. When it comes to newspapers, you can't do that. When it comes to TV stations, the court has directly said, well, maybe you can do that sometimes because there are only a few TV stations. The court decided that when there were only a few TV stations. But it's never come back and looked again at that ruling. Social media companies, they're not newspapers. They're, they're, they're not exactly publishers. But when you go to Facebook, you see is Donald Trump included or is he excluded? That is going to have some bearing on what you think of Facebook. Maybe you like Facebook more. Maybe you like Facebook less. But it reflects Facebook's editorial judgment. So both of those laws were challenged. In the 11th Circuit, which is where Florida is, the, the, um, uh, the appeals court said, it violates the First Amendment rights of companies like Twitter and Facebook to tell them they have to carry this content. In the Fifth Circuit just a week and a half ago, they said, you know what? We think that these companies are so powerful, they don't have the right to censor. That law is constitutional. So you know where this is heading. It's heading to the Supreme Court. And, and just a couple of days ago, uh, Florida filed a brief in the United States Supreme Court saying, hear this case. So it's going to be a huge case. Uh, I think almost certain the Supreme Court's going to take this case. And we know from an earlier preliminary ruling that there are at least three justices that are siding with Texas and Florida and thinking that you can require these companies to do this. I'm very worried about this idea of requiring even-handedness. What if you have a political candidate who is espousing hate speech, who is saying terrible things? Now, you may have a First Amendment right to say it, but doesn't Facebook get to decide, you know what, saying these racial epithets, saying these horrible things? I don't need that. You know, I don't want that. Just like you wouldn't want... Uh, to tell Fox News or the New York Times that they have to put it on the air or in print. Right? I, I think it's very dangerous when you have government bureaucrats deciding what's even handed enough. Right? So again, these are really difficult questions under uh, this twin idea of we want to have free and fair elections, but we want to have robust political speech. So let me end with this and then turn it over to you uh, for questions and comments. I, I advance, I think, about eight different things I think the law should do. And um, I think lots of them will never be passed by Congress. But even if all of them were passed by Congress, and even if all of them passed by Congress were upheld by the Supreme Court, and I, I, again, I don't think that's going to happen, it still wouldn't be enough to deal with our social problems today, where disinformation can run rampant. And because of our commitment to the First Amendment, even if we didn't have a First Amendment, I think our social commitment in a democracy to free speech would want us to not say the government gets to, there's a government bureaucrat that gets to come in and decide what speech is allowed and what speech is not allowed. So what else can we do? Private action. So one thing, we can pressure the platforms to do the right thing, to make um, the right choices. And unfortunately, we've seen both Twitter and Facebook in recent months shut down or limit their teams that they had dealing with election disinformation. They're moving exactly the wrong direction. I think they should be pressured to do the right thing. Second, I think we need to have private subsidies of local investigative journalism. You know, having a local newspaper that provides news that can be the watchdog over City Hall, that's a public good. That's something that society should provide, even if there's not a market enough to sustain it. And we're seeing some movements in that direction. I also think we need to build up reliable intermediaries, people we can trust, people who engage in truth telling. So one example I give is, imagine that all the journalistic uh, uh, organizations came together and they said, you know, here are the five things of what it is to be a good journalist. One, you're not going to say something unless you can find two sources who will back it up. Two, you're going to make sure that um, uh, anyone you're talking about in a negative way in an article has a chance to reply, et cetera, et cetera. And then these companies give a kind of seal of approval to, okay, the Los Angeles Times, you follow these things, you get a green check mark. And then that green check mark can go uh, on uh, social media sites. And so when someone's flipping through social media, oh, this is coming from a reliable source. 
And we might have debates. Does Breitbart get the green check mark or not? Let's have that debate because that would be a debate that would educate people about how journalism is supposed to work. So I think those are things that we could do that don't require any government action. They don't require the government telling us what's true or what's not. But they're giving voters some more valuable um, information so that people can make decisions consistent with their interests and with their values. And finally, longer term, we need to inculcate values of truth, respect for science, and the rule of law. Now, lots of times when I speak, I speak to older audiences and they say, you know, we have to convince young people today, you know, the importance of civic education. And I say, yes, but it's older people who are the ones who are more likely to spread disinformation. So if we talk about educating the public, it's not just educating children in elementary school, it's educating throughout all of society. That's a really tall order, um, but unless we have a society where we can debate uh, you know, our opinions, but we, we, we agree on the facts, we're, we're just gonna be in really a difficult situation. And so when I think about elections, we need to have, and I'll end on this point, um, what's called loser's consent. It's the idea that when you hold an election, the people whose candidate comes out as a loser, they say, you know what, I'm really disappointed, my candidate didn't win, but I accept that the election was fair and square, and I'm gonna fight again uh, to uh, win in the next election. We have a number of people running for office uh, this time around who are gonna be uh, secretaries of state, they're gonna be running elections in the next election period, who make the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen. Let's say some of them are elected to office, and let's say that they run elections completely fairly. The crisis that we've seen on the right over whether elections are being done fairly is going to spread to the left. That's what I think we're going to see in 2024. Because people are not going to believe that those new people who are running elections are going to do so fairly whether they are or not. We have to find a way to be able to, oh, my computer's about to start, restart. Uh, I'll snooze that. Or not. We have to find a way, uh, I'm glad it's at the end of my presentation. Uh, we have to find a way that we can find common ground on are our elections being run fairly? How do we know that? That's kind of a very basic point in democracy and we shouldn't let interpretations of the First Amendment stand in the way. And with that, let me uh, turn it back to Ronell. I'm not sure, yes. Yeah, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll run you the mic. Um, we saw over here first. Hi, um, so my question is in regards to um, social media and spreading of election misinformation. Um, and a lot of younger people will understand this, but a lot of information on the media or on social media spread nowadays is through satire or memes or um, ironic media. Um, I know a lot of platforms like Babylon B, um, The Daily Wire, Young American Foundation, they spread a lot of their information through memes and satirical posts. Um, how, if these satirical posts or memes included disinformation, would they fall under the same regulations as just regular media that wasn't satirical, quote unquote? That's a fantastic question. Are you an undergraduate? I am. Okay, so think about uh, talking about going to law school because that's, uh, that's a great question that we, um, uh, we think about all the time. Let me first talk about it in the context of deep fakes and then come back to your point. So uh, you, know, you saw that video of deep fakes and my solution to that is label deep fakes as altered, right? So you would see that this is not the original video. Right, there was a famous one, they called it a cheap fake because it didn't use high technology. It was Nancy Pelosi speaking at a conference, but they slowed down her speech so it sounded like she was slurring her words and was drunk. Um, and that got posted and that, that went viral for a while. Um, so California passed a law, it only lasts for another couple of years. It had like one of these sunset provisions and it said uh, you can't uh, post a deep fake uh, uh, about a political figure unless it's satire. And I think that's terrible. I think that's completely unworkable. There's gonna be a government bureaucrat in Sacramento who's gonna decide if something is satirical or not. So I don't like that. That's why I say, look, you can make a satirical deep fake 
and it'll be labeled altered. You can still enjoy the satire. No one's shutting it down, but it'll have alter on the bottom, and so you'll know it's altered. It's still a satire. So I would say that if information in a meme, now to come more directly back to your question, contains a demonstrably false statement, Democrats vote on Wednesday, or Democrats can vote by text. Ha ha, we were just kidding. That's an empirically verifiable false statement about how an election is run, and I think that can be made illegal. Lots of things you can joke about, but I would say that if you lie about when, where, or how people vote, I don't think it would violate the First Amendment to make that illegal. There are certain kinds of satire that include empirically false. So you don't need a bureaucrat to, we all know, election day is on Tuesday. We can look it up. We can all agree when election day is. You don't need a bureaucrat to exercise any judgment. But anything short of that, um, I would uh, you know, continue to allow. Even things that are, you know, for example, claiming the election will be stolen or rigged. Even though I don't, I don't like that, and I think social media companies might have a good reason to remove it, I don't think you could make that illegal. Um, you advocated for uh, giving social media, um, I guess, uh, power to like censor um, different types of content. Uh, my question is like, when, how would you address when social media gets misinformation wrong? Like they, uh, they label something as misinformation or take something down, and uh, you know, it, it later is confirmed that it was actually true. Yes, great. Another great question. So first of all, I'd say. I uh, object to the label um, censorship. I would use the label censorship for government actors. When the government says you may not speak, that's censorship. When the government says you can't lie on the stand when you're under oath, I, that's a form of censorship. I think it's justified. But, but when a private company does it, that's just a choice. So when the New York Times decides they don't want to publish one of my op-eds, they're not censoring me. They're just not including my content. I could go put it somewhere else. Social media companies engage in content moderation all the time. They decide what content to include and exclude and amplify. If they didn't do that, what would our social media feeds look like? They'd be full of pornography and hate speech and spam trying to sell us stuff. Of course there's going to be content moderation if social media is going to be useful for us. So I don't think there's any problem with um, saying that social media is going to engage in content moderation. It's the same thing that Fox News does, the same thing that the New York Times does. They engage in deciding what content we see. Do they get, get it wrong? Absolutely that can happen. So let me give an example I talk about in the book. The Hunter Biden laptop. I don't know if you know this story, but in, I guess it's the spring of the election season, the New York Post ran a story about supposed embarrassing information about Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, on his laptop. And um, the New York Post ran the story, um, and um, the New York Times didn't run a story on it, the Washington Post didn't run a story about it. They thought maybe this was a Russian disinformation, it wasn't really the laptop. Facebook and Twitter removed the New York Post's story about the Hunter Biden laptop so people couldn't find it. And I say that was a huge mistake on the part of the social media companies. Turns out, a year later, both the Washington Post and the New York Times ran a story that actually was the Hunter Biden laptop, and it did contain embarrassing information. So what happened? I think the Facebook and Twitter, um, they felt like they were burned in 2016 when they posted a lot of misinformation, disinformation that came from Russia. Russia sent in, like uh, I talked about this earlier, uh, the, the you know, uh, people falsely claiming to be certain um, uh, Americans and who weren't making certain statements that they didn't. And in order to react to that, um, because the left was so critical of Facebook and Twitter for allowing the Russian disinformation to be there in 2016, they overreacted in 2020 by not letting con the content that was arguably true, we don't know if it's true or not, they said it was misinformation, they took it down. And then they were criticized for it, and they never have apologized for it. I think that was a big mistake. I, again, I don't think we can have a law about this, but I think we can rightly criticize. Uh, and I, I was on a panel uh, speaking to a group of judges with the, a former, one of the former top people at Facebook, and he completely agreed that Facebook blew it by removing that content or demoting the content, not amplifying the content. People couldn't find it. Um, 
the most important thing to do, journalists make mistakes, professors make mistakes, we all make mistakes. The important thing to do when you make a mistake is to own it, to say, I made a mistake, I apologize, or here's why I made the mistake, I'm gonna try to do better next time. And that's, that's how I think we need to deal with it. Um, yes, there are gonna be overreactions, yes, there are gonna be lack, lack of perfection, but that doesn't mean that we, sh that we shouldn't have them try. Hello. Um, so my question is, you know, something that you brought up kind of near the end of your, um, you know, your lecture is the idea that as more people move into, you know, county commissioner spots and stuff, um, the idea that the shift of not believing in fair elections is going to move from the right to the left. And um, I'm curious to know if you think that this is kind of a, a big double-edged sword is with this different you know, swapping of people thinking that elections aren't fair, do you think that that's probably the biggest threat we have currently to civic engagement as we see it right now? I don't know that I would call that the biggest threat to civic engagement, but I would call it the biggest threat to um, continued free and fair elections in the United States. Uh, so it's, a, it's an even bigger problem. Uh, uh, we know, uh, you know, almost everyone in this room is too young to remember in 2000 the disputed election between Bush and Gore. Um, but uh, uh, it was extremely close, came down to Florida, came down to about 500 votes in Florida. And um, in the end, um, the Supreme Court decided that a, a recount of votes was not warranted, that it would violate the Constitution's uh, rights of equal protection or, for, or, or, or due process. And they said, um, uh, where, um, we're gonna stop the count. Bush becomes president. And uh, when you polled people after that election, if they thought that the last election was run fairly, Democrats were much more likely than Republicans to say it was not run fairly. And we've seen this consistent pattern. If my guy won, the election was fair and square. If the other guy won, there was something wrong. But Trump has taken it to a whole new level. We've never had situations where large majorities of people don't believe the last election was run fairly. And let's say we have Trump versus Biden too, and let's say we have a fair election and Trump wins, and some of the people running the elections are people who've claimed that the 2020 election was stolen, then there's gonna be wide majorities of Democrats who are gonna be in the same boat. I don't know how you have a functioning democracy when people believe that the last election was stolen. If you think the last election was stolen, you're more likely to take steps to steal the next one. And so we have to come up with ways, and this is my major project. This is why I created the Safeguarding Democracy Project at UCLA. We have to find ways to um, not only run fair elections, but convince people that there are safeguards in place so that we can verify that we've actually run fair elections. And that's so hard to do when we're surrounded by a sea of disinformation when there are people for political and financial gain, I didn't talk about that point, let me just say a word about that, uh, for political and financial gain who have an incentive to spread false claims about elections being stolen. And let me talk about that financial incentive. Some people are getting very rich by making claims that the false election was stolen, that, that the last election was stolen. And I, again, I don't, I don't think I have a good, given the First Amendment, a good, we can't just say censorship, you can't say that, but it's, it's very dangerous for our society. Kind of going back to the point you raised regarding Texas and Florida, because I'm thinking about a potential constitutional question being how it applies to private companies, going on to your point of bolstering these local um, newspapers and also strengthening a reliable intermediaries, do you think it would be necessary or helpful for the state to then develop guidelines to prevent misinformation from these sources? Or are we just kind of going on the assumption that they're reliable or just thinking that they'll come up with their own guidelines? Yeah, so as much as I would like a law that would mandate truthful information, it's so contested. Uh, I don't think we can do that. And I don't think we, you know, maybe we can have the government have subsidies, but the, the subsidies can't be under the First Amendment. They can't be viewpoint dependent. You know, you can't say, well, I like what you have to say, so we'll give you money. I don't like what you have to say, you can't get money. So I think we're talking about private uh, enterprise. So here's a good example um, on the national level is something called ProPublica. They're a public interest newsroom, and they um, uh, do investigative reporting. They're funded by billionaires. You know, we have a very 
um, unequal, uh, a society with unequal wealth, and we have to depend upon the beneficence of very wealthy people. And now uh, ProPublica is partnering with, I think, 20 different local jurisdictions to develop local versions of this. Um, you know, the, um, in Australia, very different system, they want to tax, or they are taxing, social media companies to help subsidize newspapers. I mean, I think we could probably do that in this country, but then we wouldn't be able to choose which newspapers, and you could have disinformation-filled newspapers being the ones that are subsidized. So I'm very, again, I'm very skittish about the government deciding who's telling the truth and who's not. So I, that, that why, that's why it falls into the private actor side of these things. I don't know if we, do I have time for one more question? You have time for one more. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of, especially in my childhood, there's been fewer and fewer people watching like public education programming, and there's been an increase in cable television. Do you think in any respect that there's a connection between disinformation in old generations and in our own generation with the decline in viewership of like educational programming? Well, one thing that's lost when we've, ha we've gone from, you know, five channels to 20 channels to infinite number of channels is we don't commonly experience things together. So in the 1960s, people would watch Walter Cronkite, who was the, uh, you know, the CBS Evening News, and people believed what he had to say. Um, we don't have that shared experience anymore. But now, instead of an information trickle, which had its own problems in terms of who could speak, we have a fire hose. And I certainly think that the fact that we don't have a sh we're not watching the same media. Even the Supreme Court justices, I wrote about this in another piece, they don't watch the same media. They don't get the same information. And so then you have a different worldview based on what you see. And I think that's, that's really hard. And I, I would hope that public television, public radio could serve that. But even that, or even fact checking becomes seen as politicized. So it's a really hard, hard problem. And um, it's going to be up to your generation to figure out how you come together and, and, and figure uh, out how to have a shared truth. And th that's a social project, not just a political one. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Hey all, you all are welcome to stay. There's plenty of food. Um, you can go out to the patio to enjoy. We have Caputo's charcuterie board and or into the lobby. So go ahead and stick around. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, Sinclair. Thank you.